The, the gospel is not just good news about forgiveness. It's good news about fulfillment of God's purpose in us. Put on the promises of God like you would put on a garment. Just receive that and begin to walk encircled in that. No, I think that obedience to the Lord sometimes brings a much longer time on finding out the fulfillment of what you thought he was calling you to obey in terms of a decision you made or an action you began taking, a, uh, an attitude. Uh, there are trials, and the trials are not always things other than an internal growth and in the recognition that irrespective of what reward you, you get, uh, there will be a payday, and uh, sometimes it's immediate. And there are other things that occur after a time, and then you're surprised when it finally comes, not because you gave up on God. You may have been tempted to doubt, but I think that the very fact that the temptation is there to be grown through could be even reasons that sometimes he tests us because he is, he's growing sons and daughters, you know. God is not a little nice deity that we salute and then he says, here's a candy, you know. He's, he's growing us, and, uh, but he's always faithful and the rewards always will be forthcoming. God did speak to your heart about uh, daily devotional prayer in your life, the discipline of that. Mm -hmm. What did you feel the Lord was saying to you? Well, what happened, uh, I had, over the early years at the Church on the Way, as the Lord was really, there was a breakthrough in understanding and vitality of the spirit of worship in the church, and continues to this day for that matter, uh, which is gratifying to observe in that Ann and I are attenders now at the church. <laughs> when we're home, I'm out speaking quite a bit, but uh, it's a delight to see the health of the church on the way today. Uh, worship life and the intercessory ministry of the church was very uh, strong. And in that time, these two things had begun to worship and intercession. And the Lord just said, your personal devotional habit, you've forgotten that discipline. Yeah. And it wasn't as though I didn't pray daily. It's that there were patterns of prayer that I, I, I was attentive, for example, to pray I, I didn't stop praying for our children every day, but there are things that uh, I've, I've felt I need to give attention to these daily, not as a superstitious mandate of God, but to keep my heart tuned before God about that part of our life. Yeah. I think oftentimes prayer, presenting ourselves to the Lord on issues that we list, prayer lists, is not just a recitation as though we were making a, 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 a required speech. Mm -hmm but uh, something that keeps our hearts truly tuned to fresh movement of the Holy Spirit in your life when you pray for that. I think the language of the Spirit is a tremendous gift mm -hmm. uh, that the Holy Spirit gives to assist our prayer life, to, as the Bible says in Romans 8, that we uh, don't always know how precisely we may need yeah. to pray and uh, that He'll help us mm -hmm. hit the target. And, uh, and that's important of invoking the presence and power of God, not that he couldn't do it anyway, but he, the Lord wants our partnership yeah. and what he's doing in us. this world. Yeah. Someplace in a neighborhood, a home's gonna explode with violence this week. Someplace else, a kid's gonna blow their head off with crack, not a gun, but ways that leave them nearly as devastated. And there's going to be the need for somebody to let Jesus be there the way he wants to be. The fullness of the Holy Spirit is given that Jesus might replicate himself in his people. We do not come to church for casual inspiration. I hope not. We don't come to church merely to observe a tradition. We come for a refueling, a refilling. But a refilling once a week really is not a fully adequate substitute. You and I need regularly to be receiving fresh flow of the river of heaven in order that we might be available because Jesus wants to be where you're going to be this week. The amount of water going over Folsom Dam, they say every second there's enough water for a family of five for a year. But I want to tell you, loved ones, there's a reservoir in heaven where there's a whole lot more than that and it will never empty. It'll never be drained off where there's enough for every family, for every individual, for every person, forever and ever. Amen. There's all that is needed, but you need to tap in. 
and keep on being filled with the Spirit. He says, I want you to understand that I am commanding you to relate to one another as believers in that way. But he says, if you do that, the world will notice how you relate to one another. Even when you have tough contact and problems and things you feel that justify your criticism and allow you to uh, be uncaring or whatever it may be, we all experience this all the time. There's not gonna be a week go by that in some way you have to come to terms with where you live in terms of this commandment. This isn't something that's episodic. It's not something that takes place by reason of given events. It's something that costs us something all the time. In terms, let me take one place that many people would not even think of it having to do with. It takes place every time you disagree with something you feel about a governmental leader who by biblical command, you are called to pray for those that have the authority over you. And the fact is that if you are ticked off at some governmental leader or anybody else for that matter, you cannot pray with a heart of love for their well-being. It'll be with a heart of judgmentalism for something to be visited upon them, not necessarily their death, but say, God, change all this. There's, the, the Bible says the pathway for there to be peace in a society is to pray for the governmental leadership. It didn't say what their office was. At the time that was written in the scripture, you can find it in 1 Timothy, the second chapter, and it's given as one of the priorities. Paul says to Timothy, who was at that time taking the church John is now the pastor of years later, and he says, I exhort first of all, prayer, supplication, giving of thanks be made for all men and all who are in authority that you may lead a quiet and peaceable life. If there's things fouled up in culture, don't blame the government. Blame a prayerless body of believers in the nation. And that's true. The Lord is saying, the price of possessing the promise is a removal of your dependency upon someone else who has been a blessing to you, someone else that is a problem to you, some circumstance that has been just beyond reach constantly and can it ever happen, or some circumstance that already exists and you feel would drag you down or draw you back. The Lord says it's time now to come to terms with the price of the promise and it starts with by your saying what God says, that situation is dead. It not only will be no benefit to me, it can be no problem to me. Whatever has been a point of dependency or complaint, whatever has been a point of pain or problem, the Lord says, reckon that for what it is. Through Jesus Christ, the Bible says in the sixth chapter of the book of Romans, that when we put our faith in Christ, that we are to reckon indeed, to regard indeed, those things that are the past to be dead not only the sins that we may have felt guilty for or sometimes are tempted as the adversary accuses us, but anything that would be a resistance to the Lord's promised purpose in us. There comes a place where the biblical term is reckon it indeed dead. That word that occurs there in the Greek text, logizomai, that's the old English reckon or regard or acknowledge this as being dead, we would say in various translations today. Logizomai is a mathematical term. It was a word that basically was saying, look, add it up, or look at the equation here. The way it is is there is God and you. Add it up, the promise of the Lord and his purpose in your life. Any set of terms you want to put in there that blend together what God has said and what he's opening unto you. It says, add it up. And the answer is unequivocal. The answer is in no way deniable. It only has one answer. And the answer is the promise will be fulfilled. Say it with me, will you? The promise will be fulfilled. And so the scripture says, regard anything else as being dead and put on, just like you would put on a coat, put on the promises of God like you would put on a garment. Just receive that and begin to walk encircled in that, in the confidence of what the Lord has for you. There is in this room right now such a grand body of devoted servants who are raised up to be in the midst of an evangelical ethos 
a people of passion for the supernatural and all the signs and wonders that come with it. That's my understanding of what God birthed Vineyard as. People who want to see souls saved and believe that it's the power of the supernatural work of God that makes the cutting edge for that to come about in a society so blinded or so myopic by, its, by reason of not only its hollowness and shallowness and emptiness of real supernatural so much that it seeks for the satanic supernatural as a, as a substitute, and in the face of a church, by and large, so much of evangelicalism that resists the very breakthrough dynamic that characterized the birth of the early church and exploded upon a, a pagan culture, not by reason of its academic brilliance, but by reason of its supernatural demonstration of power. Not that it was deficient of academic brilliance, but that was not its cutting edge and it didn't pretend it was the secret to anything. It only was the means of communication to interpret what was way beyond what any person could explain or bring about by human wisdom. So that Paul will say, I did not come to you with the wisdom of man's words, but in the demonstration of the spirit and power. And there's not anyone in this room that doesn't understand those are your roots. It's what you were raised to be. It's what you're about and what many of you still cherish and live in. The point is that the Lord calls us to serve. He calls us to things that sometimes we fear. With Mary, she doubted her sufficiency or adequacy. She would say, how can this be? And she makes the obvious observation. You're talking about having a baby since I don't, I don't, I've never had a husband, never been with a man. The very thing she, saw, she thought was her weakness which was fundamentally her qualification because she wouldn't have been approached if she hadn't been a virgin because the prophecy called for a virgin. Consider the possibility that something you feel you're incapable of is in itself your very qualification for why the Lord is choosing you because he wants to show himself strong through you and rejoice you. She will sing nine months from now, my soul does magnify the Lord because she discovers things God could do that transcend her imagination, the amazement of the goodness of God through her. But in the meantime, it was not convenient because she will conceive. The answer to the question, however, is the same answer today. How can this be? Well, the angel answers and says, the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you. It is not by might ever or by power ever, but by my spirit saith the Lord. And the ability and the capacity the Holy Spirit will give to any one of us for the simplest obedience, no matter however impossible it seems to us, because it is usually the impossible side of the summons that preoccupies us. And he's saying to you, I'm only asking you to respond. When you come to the end of this text, she will say, be it unto me according to thy word, because she's come of the persuasion of what the angel also said. Well, when God gives a word, there is the power attendant to it, inherent in it. When he said, let there be light, there was not a voice in the darkness somewhere saying, no. <laughs> or did not say, how can there be light? There was power in the word that became light. And in that environment, our call is to intercede for those not only who cannot, but those who will not. And to come not with a heart of judgmentalism or criticism. Concern is one thing. Anger, judgmentalism, I cannot, I cannot intercede really for anyone I'm mad at. I need to forgive first. There needs to come the heart of the Lord. That evidence is the very text we just quoted a moment ago or read from Isaiah when Jesus is making intercession for us all. The first thing that he did once the blood began to come from his body and the cross is staked high and lifted up are these words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Forgiveness is what opens the door to effective intercession. The, one of the reasons the church today is crippled 
is because it is better schooled in political judgmentalism, analysis, criticism, than it is in its call first to be forgiving to the broken edges, not just to people they know around them, but of society in general, no matter how grotesque, corrupt, or evil anything may be, and then accompany that with intercessory prayer, however brief, however lengthy, however simple, however discerning. Okay? All things work together for good who those that know the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. How many know that verse at least by recognition, okay? Romans 8, 28 is preceded by Romans 8, 26 and 27. It says, we often don't know how we ought to pray, but the Holy Spirit comes to help us beyond our limitations so that as we pray with his help, all things will work together for good to them that are called according to his purpose. You can't separate those things. Why can you pray? You say, well, I just, I just like the, the last verse. I like for everything to work out well. Well, God wants everything to work out well too, but he calls people to pray for things to be transformed and turned around and intruded upon by the work of God, and he calls for his people to pray. And I believe, honestly, that when Jesus said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, that it was not so much intended to be a surge of boom, 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 man, there it is. And you muscles come bulging out of your, you know, spiritual muscles come, you know. I believe that the power he gave us is the power that every one of us in this room need, not just entering a new year, but in times like these when the darkness increases and our nation is en route to serious problems unless an interceding church arrives, that the power the church needs is the power to pray. The power to pray. The power to pray. Uh, you talk about advancing beyond the usual limit. And I just want to read this, oh, I think this is a faith-igniting, hope-inspiring statement. God sees something in me that excites him, something of life and purpose for you that is the reason he called you to himself. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I think the most exciting thing about the, the truth of the Word of God is, the, in, is to discover the enormity of God's delight with his creature man, not with the fall, not with the failures, not with the mistaken choices, but he, he really does dearly love us and treasure us, and that's why he paid so great a price to regain the possibility of our opening to discover how grandly and marvelously he cares, mm -hmm. and what the largeness of his purpose is in us, you know, that passage in Ephesians chapter 1 where Paul said that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened that you may know what is the greatness of his hope in you. It's just each one of our four children, <clears throat> Anna and I would hold in our hands and look at this little child and get excited about what has now become adult and parenting and some of them grandparents now, realities and uh, with fruitful lives and we've had hopes for them. Well, God has brought us to himself and says, I've got hopes for you. And it's not God saying, I just, you, I get tired of you and I wish you'd leave me alone. He's saying, you know, stick with me. There's a lot of stuff I'm gonna do with you. <laughs> so I, I just, I love that. And that's, the, the gospel is not just good news about forgiveness. It's good news about fulfillment of God's purpose in us. Thank you so much for watching here in Lake Church, Houston, Texas. Don't forget to subscribe, share the video with your friends, and keep watching our channel. God bless you.